If there are a thousand chefs, there will be a thousand flavors. Chinese cuisine is mysterious and unique. Whether in the city or in the country, culinary skills are still taught by word of mouth, and a chef's skill depends on his own understanding. The forefather's wisdom, a family's secret recipes, a master chef's special lessons, and a gourmet's appreciation. Every gourmet moment represents a message of the heart, handed down from generation to generation. It's May. In Huizhou, the rape has ripened. The locals use rapeseed to make cooking oil. The farmers are hard at work. Their labors will ensure that they'll be able to cook their specialities over the next 12 months. In Chinese cooking, oil is the medium between the wok and the food being cooked. Cooking in hot oil produces some rich and wonderful effect. Vegetable oils are easier to come by than animal fats, and they're healthier too. This discovery was a huge step forward in the culinary history of mankind. A rape field in bloom is a spectacular sight. The plant blooms in early April. Chung Yajung runs the only oil mill in Fuai village. The whole village depends on it for its cooking. Like all Chinese, Cheng Yajung pays respect to his ancestors on Tomb Sweeping Day. The Chinese believe that abundance is a blessing from the ancestors. Bumping into Cheng Yajung near the field is a sure sign that freshly pressed rapeseed oil will soon be available. As the spring rains come to an end, fine weather is expected over the next few days. This is the best time to harvest rape. The harvest is left in the sun for five days to let the husks dry making them easy to thresh. This is the end of the plant phase for these rape seeds. Next, they will embark on a fantastic journey. The easy-going Cheng Yajung becomes more critical when he's purchasing seeds. Thirty years of experience have given him a sharp eye. The seeds must be nice and round and dark and lustrous with no impurities. He applies strict control over the seed's moisture content to keep it below 11%. This is to ensure that they can last while preserved over the next 12 months. The oil press goes into production in June with workers from nearby villages. Cheng's wife prepares their lunch. First, the seeds are heated to break down their cellular structure. This lowers the adhesion between proteins and oil, making the oil easier to extract. As the first rape seeds crack open, their odor begins to permeate the entire village. Rapeseed oil has a unique pungent smell that is, for many people, an acquired taste. But the people of Huizhou are especially fond of it. Huizhou stinky tofu, known for its mild odor and extraordinary flavor, must be deep fried in rapeseed oil to be at its best.
Before the oil is extracted, the seeds are ground. Then an experienced worker steams the pulp for just long enough and forms it into narrow discs. All of the discs must be exactly the same size and shape. Like the much more expensive olive oil, rapeseed oil is good for you because it's rich in monounsaturated fats, but it has its drawbacks. One of them is the thick smoke it gives off during cooking. Modern technology has dramatically raised the smoke point of rapeseed oil. This, together with other bio-modifications, has greatly improved its quality. Hello, Kaltana. For Huizhou people, the story begins with the very first press of the oil. Wedge oil presses can be traced back over a thousand years. In the age of electrical machinery, the sheer physicality required to work this press is impressive. The hammer, weighing over a hundred kilograms, slams against the wedge to create a huge pressure in the chamber and crush the pulp. The pressure squeezes the oil out. The banging and pressing goes on for three hours. In a world driven by profit and quick results, the oil press is a reminder of the ingenuity of the ancients. The history of rapeseed oil in China goes back a thousand years. It's widely used throughout the Yangtze Delta region. It's versatile, being used in all cooking styles, and it is a key ingredient in making chili oil, in which Sichuan people are the experts. Chilies dehydrate and release their aroma when heated. When ground, chilies can soak up more of the rapeseed oil. The key is the temperature of the oil. If it's too low, the chili's aroma doesn't fully come out. If it's too high, the chilies may burn. Chinese chefs judge the temperature by experience. The mixture is left to stand for a day to bring out its capsaicin and red pigment. Chili oil is the soul of Sichuan cuisine. In the hands of Sichuan chefs, the unremarkable rapeseed oil undergoes a Cinderella transformation into chili oil, brightly colored, intensely pungent, and aromatic. By comparison, life back in Huizhou is pretty bland. How much is it? 9.5 kilograms. Chang Gola's harvest for the year was converted to 10 and a half kilos of rapeseed oil. He can retrieve it from the press at any time and his claim never expires. This is the oil press's commitment to the villagers. It is often said that in order to survive, you have to acquire skills. This traditional wisdom is even more true in the countryside. The hills look drab after the autumn harvest. Zhang Shoshin is waiting for the right weather. This weather is good for drying noodles.
Decades of experience give the best ratio of salt to water. The salty water is added to the flour, aligning its proteins more densely. The dough is then made more elastic by kneading. Zhang Shushin's leg is playing up again. He cannot walk properly, so his wife has to make the dough with 35 kilos of flour all by herself. Midnight. The dough has been left to rise. It's now time to start shaping it into thick strands. As a young chef, Zhang was renowned for his exceptional culinary skills. Would-be apprentices used to travel long distances to join him. His wife acquired the same skills after their marriage. I started making dry noodles when I was 15. I've been in the trade ever since. I know every single detail in the process. Good quality hung noodles can be sold in the city centre, or even sold to other cities. The Jungs relied on noodle making to bring up their five children. Once dried in the sun, hung noodles are easily stored. Continuous fermentation gives the noodles a hollow centre, which makes them taste soft and silky. Archaeologists have discovered noodles from 4,000 years ago. This staple food, once known as soup pastry, is an everyday feature of Chinese life. But noodles vary from place to place in thickness, in form and in the way they're made. Known for their simplicity, noodles can be eaten on their own or they may be mixed with any other food to complement their flavour. By dawn, Zhang's strands of dough have completed their second leavening. It's time to make noodles from them. In the dry air of northern Shanxi, the dough dries quickly. But what counts most is how quickly Zhang and his wife can wind the strands around the rods. The noodles are placed into a box for another round of leavening, which will allow them to stretch even more. On the Lurs Plateau, where Chinese civilization originated, the farming tradition is passed down from generation to generation. The patriarch of every family in the cave dwellings here strives to leave something behind for his descendants. Sooner or later, materials will run out but the skills of craftsmanship last for a lifetime. Come up here. For young people, the outside world is more attractive. Once they leave to work in cities, they don't come back to noodle making. Grandpa is becoming less mobile. It's time for the grandchildren to take over. Is it done? Are the noodles ready? They're ready. Jian Wei, hang up the noodles.
A rod is used to part the noodles. They are of the right weight and elasticity with 160 noodles per bundle. They can be stretched to a length of three meters. In the final step of the process, this wall of silver strings is exposed to the sun in the open air. Old people have made noodles for generations. They passed on their skills from generation to generation. The snowy white hung noodles have brought a sense of warmth to this family on the plateau for generations. The heart's message to the next generation is not only one of craftsmanship, there's also the attitude to life, such as one's conviction, hard work, and perseverance. In contrast to the people of the north, the people down south prefer foods made of rice. These foods aren't easily made. The many different types of rice cake demand a high level of craftsmanship and a well-managed apprenticeship program. Rice cake. A delicate hand is required at every stage of the process. Glutinous rice mixed with water is ground to make a fine powder. Mixing different types of rice flour to create a variety of flavors and textures is the basic skill in making Sujo-style rice cakes. The baker is an expert in using bakery weapons or natural seasonal fillings, mint in summer and autumn, and rose petals in winter and spring. Bayan, or whiteboard, is one specialization in Chinese cooking. A Bayan chef works only with rice, noodles, and pastry. This is Suzhou-style rice cake. In China, being a chef is a highly traditional occupation that one learns through apprenticeship. Young people can learn the basics from a culinary academy, but an aspiring chef must learn at the feet of a master. The master-protégé relationship is the most important non-family relationship in Chinese culture. Making the dough is essential. Your dough represents your strength. Continue. Lu Jemin has 20 apprentices, but not all will learn all his secrets. Shia is 20. She finished school three years ago and moved to Suzhou with her parents. Dad's been away, so mom takes care of everything. I want to make money to help my parents so that I don't need to ask for money. People say that girls don't need to work so hard. Better to marry a wealthy husband, but I prefer to make my own living. She 
dim sum, a plate of buns, a bowl of noodles, and a big bun. A piece of sticky cake. You should be able to feel it. The color is quite good, but it isn't thick enough. I can teach you the skills and the rest will be up to you. Deep in the mountains, some 1,400 kilometers from Suzhou, is a primitive food that opens a window on the evolution of cake in China. The days are getting shorter. It's time to go digging for fern roots. European archaeologists have discovered that the most ancient bread was made with starch extracted from fern roots. This secret ingredient was also chanced upon by the ancestors of the Yao people in the Mang Mountains. With it, they make a traditional Chinese cake, dok. Deng Kaifeng's ancestors were nomadic Yao farmers. In the days when there was a limited supply of food, dok was a winter staple of theirs. Today, the Yao people make dok more for its delicious taste, but also as a way to remind the young of past hardships. They use materials from the forest to make a sophisticated filtration system. Deng's father taught him how to acquire natural gifts from the mountains and to revere the mountain gods. He heats and stirs the mixture until it thickens and turns into a goo. The goo is very sticky. Only Dung's father can handle it properly. The goo is covered in starch flour before being broken into balls, ready to be served. Children like sweet dock more. The pleasant smell of sesame seeds complements the sweetness of the dock. This is the secret Yao flavor that's been passed down for generations. It's also how flavors are recorded in the universal language of food. Shi Er's master demands top quality dishes, and this makes her very nervous. Take them to the customer. She has made many attempts. Now the master has finally approved of her triangular dumplings. It's going to be her debut as a chef. A sense of accomplishment spurs her on. She stays back every day to practice with leftovers. Suzhou pastry is one of the main schools of pastry making in China. It's an icon of Suzhou, just like the city's classical gardens. Industry represents another side of Suzhou. Its modern factories attract 7 million internal migrant workers, making Suzhou China's second largest migrant city. But one can still find something of the legendary. As a highly experienced expert in Bayan, Lu Jemin has a special skill. Suzhou boat pastry has fillings. For plant shapes, we put in bean and lotus seed paste. For animal shapes, we use meat as the filling. He can make pastries in plant and animal shapes. Iconicity is important in creating both Chinese calligraphy and Chinese pastries. These pastries are more than just food. 
They contribute to people's aesthetic experience and enjoyment of life. It takes great knowledge and skill to make boat pastry delicacies, so called because they were traditionally served to wealthy passengers traveling by boat. It is already a great privilege to observe such craftsmanship, yet the master has something else in mind. He's been looking for the right protege to pass his skills on to. Shia has only just embarked on her journey to become a Bayan chef. She still has a long way to go. Culinary knowledge is also handed on regularly in everyday life. A busy day in Shanto begins with the hustle and bustle of a seafood market. Every day, Chen buys ingredients for his family's restaurant. The young man is a regular customer at the market. Chen's father, Chen Shabao, used to be the head chef in a large restaurant. He has four daughters, but Chen is his only son. In China, there's nothing more natural than a son rising to take over the family business. But a few years ago, Chen was admitted to university in Guangzhou, and he wanted to try his luck there. Life at university and after university was very different. I suddenly felt a lot of pressure after graduation. Having no luck in the job market, Chen returned home to help in the family restaurant. Its signature dish is oyster pancakes. Chen needed to start from scratch to learn how to make this common Shanto dish properly. He'd never even washed dishes before. Oysters grow in the shallow waters offshore. The earliest record of oyster farming goes back over 2,000 years. In Jingzhou, oysters are every family's livelihood. The locals prefer small, fleshy oysters, which taste better and are in high demand for making oyster pancakes. Shanto is an old city with a rich history. One has to go deep into its alleys to find the most original oyster pancake recipe. The oysters are first soaked in a sweet potato starch solution, so they don't shrink as quickly when heated. The oyster pancakes are fried until they're golden brown, all the while making sure they stay succulent. Fish sauce is the perfect condiment for oyster pancakes. They're crispy on the outside and succulent on the inside. Oyster pancakes make up only a small part of the family business. Its main business is large on-site catering. Chen is going out to a job with his father as a kitchen hand. Chen has a degree in business administration and yet here he is working with food. He's learned that carving a garnish is no easier than solving a maths equation. I'm learning new things, growing up every day. Of course, there is a process. At the beginning, people might not be positive about you. Today, Chen is being given the opportunity to make a dish. His father double checks and gives it the green light.
My cooking skills have improved. Sometimes I've received praise. That made me happy. In today's rapidly developing China, people are keen to try out new things. To hold on to traditions or to let them go? That is the question. Yangzhou is a distinctive city in the Yangtze River Delta region. Yang Mingkun is 63. He's a storyteller. In the past, we had to go around telling stories. We needed to do that for a living. One storyteller had to do a whole show. <laughs> Young Josh storytelling is a 400-year-old folk art. Wars, heroes, love, betrayal. An eloquent storyteller tells of them all. <laughs> Young is also a connoisseur of cooking. <laughs> Going out to do shows, we had to cook for ourselves. That forced us to learn how to cook. Sometimes, restaurant chefs were in the audience. They were very happy to teach us their skills. Young enjoys chatting with chef friends about cooking secrets and tips. Scalded, shredded, dried tofu epitomizes Young Zhou people's attitude to life. Dried tofu is cut into 28 thin slices before being chopped into shreds. The fine shreds are nice and elastic. Cut them very finely so the ginger flavor can be absorbed. The tofu is rinsed three times with boiling water to remove its soy smell. Finally, soy sauce and sesame oil are added. The humble-looking dish is soft-textured and intensely aromatic. Young is preparing a family banquet. This is a yearly custom when he, as the master, makes a meal for his apprentices. Here it comes. <laughs> to hand down gourmet knowledge, there must first be a gourmet. Young's rich life experience and sharp taste buds give him a firm grip on the essence of Young Zhou cuisine. Nobody has a greater knowledge of the authentic flavors of Young Zhou. <laughs> Chanto is a city on the move. Chun is giving it his best. Clams, pippies, Bombay duck, which is actually a fish. Customers can mix and match any of them. The family's oyster pancake recipe, four generations old, is being reinvigorated. Through trial and error, Chun has managed to add new ingredients to the traditional oyster pancake. A once familiar dish is now full of pleasant surprises. The vitality of innovative cuisine reflects the inheritance and refinement of tradition. Our hearts are touched by the taste of flavors that have evolved over time. Once upon a time, there was a group of country chefs on Sunlin Road in Shanghai. They had come to the Shanghai Bund to make a name for themselves. In the last hundred years, they've produced some top chefs. One family in particular has been in the trade for five generations. After many decades, they're still active in the culinary world. Li Mingfu manages the family restaurant. 
He goes shopping in the market at five o'clock every morning. We had a full house today. It's been very hot lately. Watch out for the heat. Diners are coming. We'll be very busy. Every evening, there's turmoil in the kitchen. Li Yu operates the stove, and Li Wei does the knife work. Li Mingfu's two sons are in joint command of the kitchen. The brothers have surpassed their father in cooking. He can now leave the kitchen to them. Nothing pleases him more than seeing his sons follow in his footsteps. The Huangpu River bears eloquent witness to Shanghai's development. In the culinary history of this open, inclusive city, where the West blends in with the East. There is an amazing and distinct cuisine of humble origin. Far from being assimilated into other styles of cooking, it forges distinct characteristics of its own. This cuisine forms the culinary foundation of Shanghai. It is Shanghainese cuisine. Li Bo-rung is 83. He's built up a reputation as a top chef in Shanghainese cuisine. A musician never stops practicing. Neither does a chef. There are no shortcuts. <laughs> Li Wei and Li Yu became Li Borong's apprentices at age 14. Knife work is a basic skill in Chinese cooking and an indicator of a chef's competence. Fine slicing. The wrist controls the precise strength, location and direction of cutting. Fish boning requires a detailed knowledge of the structure of the fish. This allows the chef to slice at the exact points to bone the fish. Knife work resembles swordsmanship, in which full mastery is achieved only after years of hard training and practice. signature dish is the shredded three. The flavoursome ham, chicken and bamboo shoots are thinly sliced before being cut into shreds less than half a millimetre thick. are cooked through first. They are then shredded to help them soak up the soup. The flavours of the three ingredients are released and intermingled at once when steamed. The exquisite presentation of the dish is thanks to the chef's incredible knife work. Chinese cuisine emphasises the perfect integration of flavours and aesthetics.
One brother is a knife work expert and the other specialises in heating. Deep fried river prawn. They're fried for less than 10 seconds. The oil is preheated to 200 degrees Celsius before the prawns are put in. The timing has to be perfect to make the shells crispy but keep the flesh tender. He knows when to take the prawns out by listening to the crackling of their shells. The prawns are put back into the wok to help make the sauce that goes with them. Precise timing is maintained throughout. The heating must also be meticulously controlled. Sizzling pot is a Cantonese dish that illustrates the importance of controlled heating. Intense heat is used to minimize the cooking time and lock in the freshness of the ingredients. The chef must also adjust the duration and intensity of heating based on how far away from the kitchen the customers are sitting. The cooking continues while the pot is on its way to the customers. If this were an opera, the dish would be finished just as the curtain was raised, or in this case, just as the lid is lifted. In Chinese, the word heating is not confined to cooking. It can also be used to describe one's attitude to life and to others. Li Borong is very excited about visiting the kitchen he once headed. Practice makes perfect, or the skills won't come to you. Li Borong began his apprenticeship in 1945. He retired at the age of 80. Times have changed. He has sailed through the ups and downs of life, but has never laid his cooking utensils to rest. He has earned honor and respect by his diligence, his passion for learning, and his passing on of his knowledge to the next generation. Poetry and Peking opera are not the only vehicles of Chinese culture. Even the most minor thing in daily life can be a cultural vehicle. From that perspective, chefs are the great recorders and transmitters of culture. The pomace from the oil press makes excellent fertilizer. In Shanxi, Zhang Shexin's grandchildren hang out their handmade noodles. In the Hmong Mountains, the Yao people are grateful as ever for the gifts of the mountains. The Chinese people continue to appreciate life and the world around them in their own ways, through their hands, their taste buds, and their hearts. Whenever anyone turns on the stove or picks up a bowl, in that very instant, they become a contributor to the incredible poetry of flavors. What magnificent flavors, unbeknownst to men, are hidden in the remote and inaccessible forests, rivers, grasslands, and deserts of China. 
How have humans worked with nature to preserve flavors and recipes down to this day? Trying circumstances make us search for and discover extraordinary people and food.